Extreme pursuits have never been just the exclusivity of Generation X and Y out there. 52-year-old Don McIntyre is living proof. Don's latest mission is as a part of a team to fly gyrocopters 13 and a half thousand kilometers around Australia. Now, I'd said for 23 years that I would never ever fly a gyrocopter because they're basically too dangerous, you know, too many people have been killed in it. It just wasn't on, I was never going to fly a gyrocopter. Went up for a 20 minute flight and uh, thought, whoo, how cool is this? Well, he's not dumb, you know, he knew, <laughs> he knew I'd be into it. And uh, then he starts talking about a round Australia flight and I thought, oh, that could be fun. And if all goes well, um, I might prove myself wrong. It may, may not be as dangerous as we think, as long as you're in the right one. <laughs> Don McIntyre seeks out every opportunity to find new adventures. His wife, Margie, affectionately referred to as Ted, is never far from his side. Together, they cross the globe in search of new challenges. Some people are like thrill seekers. Um, I'm more an experience seeker. I like the experience. Along the way, you can get some big scares, <laughs> but that's different, say, than guys doing base jumping. Learning something that you know nothing about and experiencing something different. So that's where I reckon I'm coming from. I see world through my eyes from when I was 28. Now that I'm sort of getting over 50, it, it's not as if I'm looking at the world from a 50-year-old. It's just exactly the same as if I was 28. I don't think I'd do anything different. Basically, I suppose one of the fundamentals that drives the issue is just having fun. Now, if you're not having fun in life, what's it all about? People will quite often say, that, geez, you're lucky, you know, you're lucky to have all this money to go and do all this stuff and da-da-da. I can absolutely guarantee 100% without any qualifications that if I was unemployed and had no money to my name, I'd go out and get a job and earn a thousand bucks from somewhere and I could have just as much fun with a thousand bucks. You don't have to have money to have adventure. There's two things that, that are the same no matter what you do. One is it's so easy to give up. You know, it's so easy to say it's too hard or it's too expensive or it's, it's you know, I'm not good enough or all those sorts of things. It's very easy to give up. And once you do give up, it's all over. If you make life too easy, you, you, get, you lose the peaks, you lose the emotions, you know, you, you're not cold, you're not hungry, you, everything's happening like this and just go, and the next minute it's just flatlining. How boring is that? You know, sometimes you've got to push yourself to get outside your comfort zone and then you're really living. We're just in that weird percentage that want to keep pushing ourselves to do things because some people are quite content staying at home and having three kids and I think I could not do what they do and they look at our life and go, God, we couldn't do what you do. Don's next adventure could be his most dangerous. He's joined by experienced pilots Willie Ewig and Otmar Berkner. The three of them are hoping to be the first to fly gyros around Australia. We're heading uh, from Sky Ranch, which is out from Tamworth, across to uh, Cape Byron, which is the furthest east in Australia, and then straight up to Thursday Island, which is the uh, top of Cape York Peninsula, and that's the furthest north of Australia. Then we come back down and we go across the Great Sandy Desert and all the other deserts and head across to uh, Shark Bay in Western Australia. That's the furthest west in Australia. 
Then we're heading straight across the bottom to the uh, Great Australian Bight, then down through Victoria to Apollo Bay. And if the weather's good, we're going to give a crack of uh, getting across Bass Strait and uh, heading down to the southeast Cape in Tasmania, which is the further southern part of Australia, and then back up across Bass Strait and home. So uh, it'll be about 13,500 miles. I reckon it'll take about four weeks. Willie reckons it'll take about 18 days, but we'll see. And uh, it'll be the first time that any gyros have done anything like that in Australia, that's for sure. Don is dead keen on flying. It's unbelievable. I mean, I talked about flying, and he always said, man, we actually want to come with you. And then I thought, oh, let's do it. Come with us, why not? And it's a silence and yeah, why not? Don't you understand? I'm rolling all the way to you. Just trying to get to you. Just trying to get to you. I'm trying to get to you. I'm trying to get to you. I mean, basically, um, uh, Willie's prepared the machine, you know, my machine, and uh, he's sort of come up with the general route and the flight planning. I've been in charge of all the sort of safety survival gear and, uh, uh, you know, sort of cameras and bits and pieces as well. Otmar is, uh, he's uh, generally the boss now, I suppose, to make sure everything runs right with the machine. So, uh, so we've all had our different roles to play, and, and, it's, and so far it's working okay. I've got to treat this very carefully because I know I haven't got the flying skills that these guys have. They're mindful of my aptitude at the moment, but if I think when I'm going around I can't keep up or I'm, it's physically getting too demanding or too dangerous to my standard, I'm going to have to pull the pin and then possibly uh, carry on by myself, which, you know, at my own pace. I'm rolling across this land I'm rolling across this land I'm rolling Across this land to you. Well, I'm not doing it. It's a flight around Australia. I've always wanted to do a flying expedition. Uh, that's something that's uh, always been burning in the back of my mind. It's like jumping into rally cars for the first time. It's all new and different. So, so this is a, a great opportunity to do it. This isn't the toughest, but I'd have to say it's probably the, you know, I think in some ways it's probably the most high risk adventure that I've been involved with because a lot of this comes down to machinery and uh, you, you have to have faith in the machinery, but machinery can always go wrong. All the way across this land All the way across this land All the way Renowned for their simplicity in design, gyros were invented as an aircraft that could be flown safely at low air speeds. It's actually fairly easy. We do have a stick in our middle. That means basically the stick in the flight stays in about this position. If you want to go faster, you get the stick gently forward. And if you want to go slower, you get your stick back. If you want to turn to the right, get a stick to the right. If you want to turn left, stick to the left. So that's basically the main steering. We do have some rudder paddles actually in the front where we can steer the rudder in the back. And the other thing is that's the throttle, that's on full throttle, and that's on idle. This here is the brake. We put the handbrake on, putting this forward, and we do have a choke here. Your throttle is your height, so when you want to climb, you put more throttle on, you climb. If you want to go down, you just ease the throttle, and then you will descend. The safety of gyros has had a checkered past. Many pilots consider these small aircraft too dangerous. Well, the hardest part will be keeping the gyro up when we're landing. <laughs> Gyros are renowned for what's called a dynamic rollover or uh, uh, whatever, but uh, let's just hope we can keep it all in one piece. Fuel is going to be an issue, uh, trying to get fuel the places that we want to go in terms of our route. And uh, even though we're not planning it, um, if we get big headwinds, we may have to land on a roadway <laughs> and pull up at a service station or something. I mean, it's not planned, but, but there's some of the challenges that we might face. The thing is actually is we have to cross three deserts and uh, we have to fly a little bit over water. 
It really doesn't worry me a hell of a lot because, I mean, I fly, you know, sometimes I fly seven, eight hours a day. Why shouldn't it run actually straight line over water or over the desert? There is a risk, of course. I mean, it's, you can't say there's no risk at all. So there is a risk, but it's calculated, so it's, it's all fine. Well, the last thing you want to do if you're flying over an ocean is uh, make a landing there because gyros don't float, they sink very quickly and you can't exactly jump out in a hurry because you've got the rotor spinning as well. So there's a procedure. If you do have an engine out and you have to make a landing on the sea, just as you're about to land, you've got to try and tip it on its side and smash the rotor blades off in the water and then you can get out as quick as you can. For me, I've made my own little um, pact that if we have uh, three unintentional landings anywhere around the trip before we go across Bass Strait for whatever reason, you know, running out of fuel, bad spark plugs, a broken part. If we have to come down and we don't intend to come down, on the third time, that's it, I won't do Bass Strait. While flying gyros around Australia is high risk, Don has endured many mental and physical hardships on his previous adventures. In 1995, Don and Margie headed south to spend a year in isolation at Camp Denison, one of the most remote places on Earth. First part about Antarctica, it's very raw. It's, it's um, totally honest with you, and uh, you've got to be very careful because you are not only on your own, but um, you're in an alien environment. You're not meant to be there. There's no humans living in Antarctica, and, and especially uh, once summer disappears and you, you, you move out of the 24-hour daylight uh, and you go into a day-night cycle, everything else disappears. All the animals disappear. The birds fly away. There's nothing left at all. And you go into this sort of dark period where uh, uh, because there's nothing else left there, you think, mm, I don't think we're meant to be here. Because it's so raw and honest and simple and dramatic, it is literally like being on another planet. The first time, there's nothing in your, in your psyche, there's nothing in your memory bank to, to relate it to, even though you've seen the pictures and read the books and all those sorts of things. When you see it in real life, it's totally different. The barometer's dropped about 30 millibars in the last four hours or something. Um, and it's down really low now, so we're in a classic visit. The temperature's going up, it's gone up from uh, minus 24 and it's currently minus 18, so this is a typical visit. I didn't enjoy the darkness because I wasn't prepared for going into losing, you know, like 20 minutes of sun each day. So we had the period from about March to October where we had gradients of maybe 10 minutes sun to 20 minutes sun to an hour. So there's just these long, dark patches and you couldn't do anything. We wanted this frontier experience and the, the unique place about Cape Denison was that being the windiest place on the face of the earth, if the President of the United States said, go and get the McIntyres out, I don't want them there, for seven, eight months of the year, even the, the might of the American sort of government couldn't have got you out because the conditions are so severe. So you're totally on your own, no one can get to you and that, that adds a new dimension to the whole idea of the adventure of it. Never knew whether the hut would blow away, the wind is so severe, you know, you'd get 240 kilometre hour gusts regularly. Um, the worst we had was stuck inside the hut for up to 20 days uh, without getting outside, and the hut's the size, size of an average bathroom. We built the best box we could with the money we had, but it wasn't ideal because it had an aluminium heat sink going through from the outside of the hut to the inside and basically turned turn the hut into a freezer. So when you turn the heater off at night time, temperatures would always drop pretty quickly and in the mornings you'd be minus 12. The coldest we had was minus 18 degrees Celsius inside the hut and all the ice is sort of frozen inside and your, your breath is sort of freezing to the edge of your, your sleeping bag. I think the majority of expeditions you'll go, it's horrible. Like you probably enjoy 5% of it and 95% it'll just be horrible. Like, you know, you'll be cold, you'll be wet, you'll be miserable when you're sailing. You won't have a shower, the toilet on the boat will probably block up. The food isn't, you know, exactly what you'd, you know, dream of. I think it probably brings you closer together because the person that you're counting on to help you survive you'll actually bond with them. Don feels the spirit of adventure has changed. Today it's much more difficult to strike out and explore new frontiers. With this whole liability thing, what's happening is 
you're basically not allowed to go and risk your own neck on anything. So you can't do it. You can't get a permit to go unless you've got a, got uh, insurance, or you can't uh, um, do it unless you've got this or that. And it's really, it's not a good thing. My argument is 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 simple on this, and that's that um, if you want to go and do something, and you're prepared to accept the risks and not expect to be rescued your own neck is on the line you should be able to you know sometimes you're not allowed to do that because the authorities say well it's it's out of your control we'll have to come and rescue if we don't hear from you for three weeks we'll have to because people will be pressuring us to go and look for you i reckon they should have a system where you have what's called a right to die contract and you can say on this contract that that you do not want to be rescued you do not want to uh, um, have anyone risking their lives to come out and uh, try and save you um, you don't take an EPIRB, you don't do all the sort of, uh, uh, you know, you basically don't even take flares, don't do anything. If you just go and, and you want to go and sail your little boat down to Antarctica and do it, just do it. Three days into their trip, Don, Willie and Otmar had already touched down at the most easterly and northerly points in Australia. It was looking like it was going to be a very quick circumnavigation of Australia. Careful, some of it's hot in there, so... <laughs> what do you reckon, boys? Pretty cool? Yes. Yeah? You'd like to fly one one day? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Flying for over 10 hours and over 1,200 kilometers on some days, the pilots were making great time across the country. But on the journey westward, problems began to emerge. Willie and Otmar wanted to speed ahead, while Don was intent on flying to a plan. He wanted to ensure they touched down at the four designated compass points in Australia. In 1990, Don competed in the BOC single-handed around-the-world yacht race, the marathon of sailing events. Sailing around the world. Well, it wasn't a cruise. <laughs> it was a, uh, a true adventure. In fact, nowadays, they're real uh, uh, on-the-edge competition where everything's extreme. But back in 1990-91, there was still quite a big adventure element to it. Uh, the boat we'd built, I used to call it unsinkable like the Titanic. It was an aluminium 50-footer uh, and uh, really strong. Um, it took me 156 days. Uh, the biggest issue, though, was just getting to the start line. It was probably a bigger battle just to get the start line than doing the race itself. In fact, at times, I thought the race was relatively easy. So busy with all the outside issues. I rem distinctly remember when we started in Newport to start gun fires. I hadn't even looked at the chart. I had no idea where we were going. I had no idea about tactics or anything, and I thought, crikey, we've just started. And I just decided to follow another boat. So for two days, I just followed another boat until I could get my head around what was going on. And then I looked at the chart and thought, my God, it's a long way to Cape Town. It was like about seven weeks. But we got there, and in the end, we came second in the event, which is pretty cool. Lots of highs and lows. I mean, you'd, sometimes you'd be off your tree if you had a really good day's run and everything's going great and the boat's just rocketing along and you've gained on some of the other competitors. It's a real high. Same when you're crossing the finish line. You know, you've finally finished another leg and think, fantastic, you know, we got through that lot. So there's the big highs. And then there's the lows where you get in a, a, a big storm or something and you'd, you'd really scare the pants off yourself. He just got rolled through 60.
and I miss Ted, and sometimes I really wish I wasn't here, I tell you. I can remember an occasion in the middle of the Southern Ocean when I had a major sail issue. I had a, a number two head sail wrapped around the foil, and it was jammed in, so it was half in, half out with a fold back, and the weather was building, you know, it's increasing. You can't just say, oh, bugger that, I'll just go to bed and sort it tomorrow. You have to do it. And I had a two and a half hour battle trying to work out how to do it, you know doing things, tried this, tried that, couldn't do it. Meanwhile, the wind's getting stronger and stronger. You have to get on with it and do it. Well, things are getting really grim here at the moment. So... It wasn't a big deal. I mean, you don't want to detract from the achievement of it, I suppose, but, but it was, was um, a little bit easier than I thought in a strange way. First light at the moment. About uh, ten past six, and I'm in Kalgoorlie, and the others have all pulled off. They uh, shot through yesterday, which was kind of interesting. Um, I basically got left behind, so I thought, what the heck, I'll just do my own thing. But anyway, so it's certainly turned into a bit of a rush, rush, rush deal. Uh, who knows where the others are? I've got no idea. But uh, I don't think I'll catch them. That's not a problem. I'll just do my own thing now and uh, carry on as a solo attempt. Willie's and Otmar's focus on speed left Don on his own. He would no longer cross Bass Strait or fly to Tasmania. His final target was the southernmost tip on mainland Australia, Wilson's Promontory. Uh, this is as far as we got last night. Um, it was pouring with rain, couldn't film, and uh, we got completely bogged up the other end of the runway. And uh, so we just left it as it was in the rain. But fortunately, it's uh, uh, dried out a little bit. Two weeks after takeoff, Willie and Otmar landed at Sky Ranch. They flew directly back east in great time, choosing to bypass Australia's most southerly point. Meanwhile, Don on his own was still on target. Well, I'm at Narandra and uh, just about to set off on the last leg of the trip. Yeah, just got to um, make sure this is another easy flight. Don't do anything wrong, just cruise through. It's going to be about six or seven hours or something. And uh, Ted's coming down. Just found out that Ted's coming. That'll be pretty cool. Miss little Ted. She's been um, working really hard to keep the website going and uh, run all my SAR times and get me the weather and all that sort of stuff. And a few other mates are coming down as well. So, uh, big party when we get to Sky Ranch. I'm always amazed that people get surprised at the things that, um, that I do, and all I'm doing is having fun, you know, I mean, why wouldn't you do it? Um, people used to say to us, they say, well, why did you go to Antarctica for a year? And I'd sort of have to look at them and say, well, why wouldn't you? I mean, you know, if you're given the chance to do it, if you had the ability to do it, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, it was a fantastic experience. Well, we locked the car, went to a bar, had a drink or two. Yeah, moved on to a park. I'm regularly scared, but um, that's a healthy emotion. It's something that shouldn't stop you from doing things. You, you work your way through it. It makes you clears your mind, and, and uh, certainly when you're, you're facing fear and, and when you're facing a challenge, you're certainly not thinking about you know doing the figures for the accountant. You're just totally and completely focused. And when it's all over, you come down, and it's sort of wow. You know, <laughs> still takes a day or two to think about the accountant. After 19 days in the air, Don McIntyre had travelled over 12 and a half thousand kilometres to become the first person to fly a gyrocopter around Australia. A life of, uh, uh, of contrast, where you've got all these ups and downs, is far more enjoyable than a life of um, bland consistency. Don't give up too early. You know, sure it can be too hard, it can be too expensive, it can take too long, I haven't got the time. If you really want to do something, just, just be focused about it. You really need to do what you want to do. I mean, if you, you don't want to have regrets, I'm a big believer of uh, don't have any regrets because uh, that'll just niggle at you forever. And, uh, you know, as you move on in life, you know, getting over 50 now, you sort of think, well, so far so good. There's not really any major regrets in the past and there's still a lot of things you want to do in the future. I think about you all the time 
I'd like to hold you again Well, I want to be more than a friend Don't tell me, baby, are you mine? Don't tell me, baby, are you mine? Don't tell me, baby, are you mine? Cause I got you on my mind Got you on my mind. Yeah, I got you on my mind.